working on this 24 hours a day. I, uh, <laughs> I was home yesterday for the first time in seven days for five hours to take a shower, change clothes. Piney Point site manager says he and engineers have been working around the clock. Manatee County has declared a local state of emergency following a leak at Piney Point. And what, what do you think about this solution they have come up with, bringing in all of these extra pumps and just trying to get the water into Tampa Bay as fast as humanly possible? They're, they're, they're trying to stop a catastrophe, uh, a, an immediate catastrophe, but they're creating a long-term catastrophe. And finds out who local fishermen say is actually to blame. Basically, it's a disaster zone. It's the worst red tide and fish kill in Tampa Bay since the 1970s. So far, producing more than 1 million pounds of dead fish and recently testing 10 to 17 times greater than what is considered high concentrations. Finnegan Bates, reporting from Lake Wobegon. Last year, many a snowbird witnessed the worst fish kill and red tide in Tampa Bay since the 1970s. Critics of Florida's Department of Environmental Protection's decision to dump over 215 million gallons of phosphorus-rich wastewater from Piney Point into Bishop Harbor linked that summer's the 2021 fish kills of both Tampa and Sarasota Bays as consequence. Following this year's migration down to Sarasota, I conducted a species survey, some sleuthing around for any fishy activity. Curious how things have progressed since especially after Hurricane Ian's landfall. Snowbird News presents Red Tide Recovery, Longboat Key Sharks Return, A Fishing Trip with Finnegan Bates, December 21st, 2022. change from a distance how fixed and desolate a beach can appear and with a closer vantage brown pelicans glide atop the first rays of dawn from seemingly nowhere as sandpipers just as suddenly poke around underfoot how the beach is made up of debris what draws the birds Waves take shore away as shells replace wash, mixing particles, remnants and replacements with each rush and fall of water to their rhythm. Each wave readjusts the beach. Tampa Bay's red tide of the summer of 2021 inundated the beaches with an extraordinary number of dead fish, about 3.65 million pounds. Dr. David Tomasco, the executive director of the Sarasota Bay Estuary Program, contextualizes what are lethal concentrations of red tide. It's killing fish both in the bay and in the Gulf of Mexico. And that means you're at a level of about 100,000 cells and we're at levels that are 10 times higher than that. 
data curated by Flores Conservation Commission, homing in on Tampa Bay, yellow dots are potentially lethal concentrations, while all orange and red are certainly lethal, well above 100,000 cells. 100,000 cells of what, exactly? These cells are called Perennia brevis, a type of single-celled algae that's a member of the diverse phylum Dinophilogelata. Algae are the foundation of any aquatic food chain, the primary producers who fix carbon dioxide into organic molecules. It is estimated that 80% of Earth's atmospheric oxygen is produced by platonic algae. Red tides are not exclusive to K. brevis. Other types of algae produce them, such as Alexandrium of Maine's coast, producing a paralytic shellfish poisoning, PSP. In Sunonitsia off California's coast, producing amnesic shellfish poisoning, ASP. In other genre produced fish kills, brown tides are the result of Aurora Cocos in the Northeast and Texas. Dinophyses are found off Texas's coast, producing diuretic shellfish poisoning, DSP. Gambriar discus is found in the tropics, producing a ciguatera fish poisoning, CFP. Carlodinium and Festeria bloom from Maryland and down the Carolinas. Microcystis is a bacteria associated with fresh water. Cape Brevis produces a neurotoxin, represented by neurotoxic shellfish poisoning, an SP, that kills crustaceans, fish, and marine mammals, and, besides poisoning if ingested, can irritate respiratory tissues of terrestrial animals. When fish swim through the red tide, the algae are trapped in their gills where the toxin is absorbed, shutting down breathing. Field assessments of K. brevis indicate that their blooms are limited by nitrogen and phosphorus. It isn't uncommon to find all these algae in low concentrations limited to small areas year-round. It is their blooms that are of significance. Seasonal changes in nutrients, light, and temperature cause fluctuations in algal populations. Red tides along Florida's coasts were long observed before human settlement. Spanish conquistador Cabeza de Vaca learned that the native peoples marked seasons in concordance with fruiting plant cycles and when fish kills washed up on shore. Before Florida's heavily developed coastlines, severe red tides were recorded. The most intense fish kill observed was in 1947, when an estimated half a billion fish died. K. brevis tends to concentrate, rise up from the bottoms and collect at the surface, forming a red tide 10 to 40 miles offshore, far away from human contributed nutrient sources. What happened to make 2021 such an anomaly? Southerly winds that spring not only kept Cape Brevis around, but pushed it much further into the bays and closer to shore than is typical. By March 25, 2021, a leak of toxic wastewater had been discovered at the defunct phosphate mine, Piney Point. Breach of a 77-acre holding pond's lining, one atop a phosphoginsum stack, led to a crack in one of its containment walls. Phosphorus, a key ingredient in fertilizers, is extracted from phosphate by dissolving the rock in an acidic solution. The rock's other materials, such as small amounts of radioactive uranium, thorium, and radium, make up phosphoginsum. What's left behind? Watery when it is first collected from processing and added to a stack, thickening as it dries over time, eventually becoming another solid layer. 
Some stacks stretch across hundreds of acres and reach hundreds of feet above the horizon. Preventing the complete failure of the stack and 460 million gallons of toxic waste pouring down upon 300 homes and businesses, Florida's Department of Environmental Protection approved a discharge of 215 million gallons of wastewater into Tampa Bay via Manatee Harbor. This wastewater set the chemistry of the bay, likely in favor for Cape Brevis to continue and intensify its bloom. The Fish and Wildlife Research Institute monitors over 100 inshore and offshore locations weekly. Each dot on the following pictographs represents a water sample collection site. Data begins January 2019 to illustrate seasonality, usually an autumn through winter phenomenon, of red tide concentrations of K. brevis. After the 2021 Piney Point disaster, unseasonal concentrations of K. brevis oriented around Tampa Bay. Further assisted by the conditions wrought by Hurricane Elsa. Not until December of that year, natural current and tidal conditions dispersed the microbes, allowing both the bay and gulf some respite. In less than a year's time, Hurricane Ian swept over Fort Myers. We are thinking of the millions in the path of this hurricane, the Category 4 hurricane slamming into Florida's southwest coast this afternoon. Ian making landfall right near Fort Myers, 3.05 p.m., winds of 150 miles an hour. One of the strongest September hurricanes to strike the U.S. in decades. The relationship between hurricanes and red tide is indirect. It is more about the conditions that are created by these storms. Hurricane winds displace surface water, while nutrient-rich waters from below, from whence the algae come, rise to the surface. Hurricanes have initiated blooms, dissipated others, and some have had no impact. is back in Sarasota County. It's showing up in the Gulf of Mexico and portions of Sarasota Bay. Now, this bloom stretches from Collier to Manatee counties and it appeared last month soon after Hurricane Ian. The offshore water physics of Hurricane Ian resembled those from Irma, which preceded a two-year red tide. How were beach conditions this winter? Only very low concentrations of K. brevis were measured near the observation location. Visual and hook and line surveys were conducted on December 21, 2022. Purple sea urchin, one of 950 species of spiny marine invertebrate. Their spines have multiple purposes, locomotion, protection, and sensory perception. Living on the sea floor, they often scrape meals, such as algae, off of rocks with their complex mouths, referred to as Aristotle's lantern. Calico scallop. These mollusks have a single abductor muscle for closing their shell. Near the edges of the shell, 
are its light-detecting eyes, round, shiny structures. Scallops swim by way of spasmodic clapping movements of their shell. Orange tunicate, filter feeders, their bodies are sac-like with two tubular openings through which they take in and release water. They are more commonly referred to as seaport. See their resemblance if left to dry out? What was once coral? Immobile colonies of genetically identical polyps. They feed on a variety of life, from plankton to small fish. A spider crab. Crabs first evolved 200 million years ago, and like so much of marine life, developed before the dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago. Could this be mammalian? Nine species of dolphin gallivant and patrol the gulf's waters. Abundant on piers are all kinds of fish-eating birds. Egret, double-crested cormorants, herring gulls, and brown pelicans. Black skimmers congregate to rest during the warm, sunny winter days. Sanderlings, peculiar how territorial they are in the winter. Almost as if they were still breeding. These larger sandpipers comb the beaches for the same forage of crustaceans, mollusks, and small fish, eating some variety of what's the beach. Constantly vigilant, getting within 12 feet of a flock, they'll rise in unison, attentive to your every move. A forester's turn flies abruptly up, like a fighter jet. It twists in air and nose dives, and unless in a dire situation, eats fish year round. On schedule, a school of mullet, many giant fish eating fish, tarpon and snook, follow these faint littoral flashes. During winter, there's a partial migration of great blue herons. During the summer months, their natural range reaches throughout Canada's subarctic. And as autumn's mists rise, many herons fly as far south as the Caribbean. Herons encountered in Minnesota are most often seen far off across the lake, or in the peripheral view just out of focus, never so close. Curious if this bird, one so keen for another angler's bait, makes it the journey north to the Minnesota River Valley. Waiting for a bite, memories echoed. 
Well, this is a sight few will ever see. Hundreds of sharks appearing in canals. Bonnet head, lemon, and nurse. This is an unnatural thing. The sharks are not there essentially through their own choice. They're there because they're seeking refuge from red tide, which can kill them. And many baits stolen in one brief tug of war. Aside from the mullet, a small flounder fluttered in the shallows. Rumors of black tip sharks being caught wafted from bar and between lanai. Bonnet heads are the most recent members of the hammerhead shark family. Their unique shape of head is called a cephalofoil, which offers some distinct advantages. Some note improved vision, while others highlight improved hydrodynamics. Research from the University of Hawaii demonstrates that pores distributed across the bottom of the cephalofoil perceive the electromagnetic radiation that all bodies emit. More recent research has confirmed that bonnethead sharks are omniferous. Not only do they ingest, but also digest seagrass. In laboratory studies, sharks fed on an artificially heavy diet of seagrass all gained weight. Pressure to develop an ability to digest a more complex diet, one that eventually incorporates stationary food, surely would yield cascading effects. And, perhaps, mitigation of the additional caloric requirements for the additional physiological function eventually manifests as the downgrading of the development of specialized organs, such as those for tracking mobile prey. Incorporating seagrass, as these meadows are the most widespread of coastal ecosystems, might have allowed bonnet heads to thrive amidst seasonal fluctuations such as red tide-related fish kills, especially if larger carnivorous competitors claim the deeper waters. Tampa Bay is abundant with the usual cast of wildlife, despite Cape Brevis concentrating past the Skyway Bridge again. 2021 was not the first time the bay suffered a toxic load from Piney Point. Even while the wastewater was dumped into the ocean, there were still millions of gallons going into Bishop Harbor. During the month of December and January, the DEP plans on discharging up to 3 million gallons a day. And how the coastline has been developed. Homes and high-rises line the entire bay. Each key complete, too, with drawbridge connections. And life keeps making its way. University of South Florida marine science professor, Dr. Steve Morosky, stresses Tampa Bay's dependent funnel dynamics. Well, there's no doubt that this is going to put uh, a big dent in uh, some of these local fish populations. Uh, many of the fish that are involved in this are not migratory, you know, so they live, you know, their life cycle in the, in the vicinity. And so there will be some residual effects from this. Consider the bonnethead shark. Not any specific anatomical part, but its behavior, their adaptability. Like memories, genes echo through time. Recovery constitutes more than the return of life to an ameliorated ecosystem. It encompasses life's accommodation of constant change, mutation.
From my first glance at the data, it too suggested that red tides were intensifying in magnitude and occurring more frequently. A joint study conducted by Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution et al. on harmful algal blooms looking specifically at red tide events since 1878 to 2022 cautioned against hasty interpretation. Quote, Although it appears that there might be a slight increase in the number of events over time, a greater than fourfold increase in monitoring effort occurred in Florida alone from the 1990s to present, and the possibility that some earlier events were missed or were not as well comprehensively characterized cannot be excluded. The frequency of documented red tides is remarkably similar across these regions over time capturing near annual occurrences in southwest Florida, frequent blooms in Texas, and rare events in the northern Gulf of Mexico and along Florida's Atlantic coast." End quote. How we've had to revise our understanding of the bonnet head shark broadening its ecological role to include grazing of seagrasses, so have the minuscule expanded our comprehension of Earth's diamondism, how ocean poisoning microbes lend to the stewardship of atmospheric chemistry. Finnegan Bates reporting for Snowbird News, over and out. Well, it's been more than a year since a leak at Piney Point forced hundreds of people to evacuate their homes and the state to dump millions of gallons of untreated wastewater into Tampa Bay. Drillers at the site are now inching closer to finishing a deep injection well to ensure the rest of the wastewater at the plant does not get into nearby neighborhoods. Critics say when you send water underground, there are unknowns like fractures and porous areas that could provide a path for it to seep into drinking water located closer. 